Hey everybody, welcome back to Gate World. We asked you to ask us a bunch of Stargate questions. So this is gonna be our first Q&A video. We're kind of all over the map here. We're talking about all of Stargate's film and television shows. We're talking about in-universe lore questions and also some production questions. We're looking at Stargate's past and a little bit at Stargate's future. So let's try this out. And if you like this format, leave some more questions in the comments below and we'll do one of these every once in a while. Let's get started. This is pretty incredible. You guys really showed up with the questions. We have over 350 replies to this after just about a week or so. Obviously not gonna be able to get to all of them, but let's pick some highlights. And if your question didn't get asked, go ahead and re-ask it. It might make it into a future video. Jim Frost says, my understanding is that Amazon bought MGM. It'd be nice to know how or where we could all post to Amazon to let them know we want more. So let's talk about this. Number one, Amazon is currently purchasing MGM, but the deal is not closed yet. A lot of folks have been asking, where's the new Stargate? Why hasn't Amazon said anything? Well, the acquisition is subject to regulatory approval by the government, so it's not likely to be finished much before early 2022. So there is hope for new Stargate, and I think now is the time to start to put pressure on Amazon to say, we want a new show. We want a show that's set in the in-canon universe. And that's just what our friends at Stargate Now Europe have been doing through the 365 days of Stargate campaign. This is on social media, it's primarily on Twitter, and I'll put a link in the description below to our news report about this. You can learn all about the campaign and the hashtags that they're using and direct those at Amazon and the Prime Video social media accounts so that Stargate fans can have their voices heard. Luke Maslin, for me, the biggest question was zero point modules. There's gotta be a hidden room in Atlantis. People bring this one up a lot, of course, Stargate Atlantis, particularly the first season, was so focused in its storytelling on finding a ZPM. Because with a ZPM, we can do things like power the city shield, we can dial home to Earth. So if this is ancient technology, why can't Atlantis just make their own? Why can't we discover someplace in Atlantis where ZPMs are manufactured? And after 20 years or so, wouldn't the team have found a ZPM facility? I think that's a really good observation. I'm gonna go with executive producer Joseph Malazzi's answer to this one, which is there's certainly some place where the Lanteans manufactured ZPMs, but it was probably in a hidden laboratory because they're so potentially dangerous. Remember, a ZPM is like a, a micro universe in a bottle, potentially very explosive energy. So you wouldn't wanna just manufacture them in the middle of the city. You have a lab accident and your planet is gone. So Joe Malazzi's idea is that there's a sort of pocket universe or pocket dimension that's accessible from Atlantis, which is where the ZPMs are manufactured. So it's a hidden laboratory much like Janus Laboratory was hidden until it was discovered by the team in the fifth season episode, First Contact. Sarkath 77, what do the Ori Stargates look like? They're different from the Milky Way gates, right? We got a lot of feedback on the video that we did on three different kinds of Stargates, which in fact covered six different Stargate models that have been seen on the series. The Milky Way gates, the Pegasus gates, the Destiny gates, uh, that little temporary gate that Orlin built, the new Stargate on the planet Tolana that the Nox helped them to build, and the Ori Supergate. Well, as a lot of folks have pointed out in the comments over on that video, yes, there are other kinds of Stargates in the universe as well. In fact, there have to be. The Ori have to have regular sized Stargates that they sent the Priors through. Because remember when the Priors first showed up in season nine of SG-1, they came through the Stargate. That's also how they sent through the segments that would make up the Supergate. Here's the thing, here's why we didn't include the Ori Stargates in that video. We never saw them. They never appeared on screen. We know that they must exist, but we don't actually know what they look like. I kind of like the idea that they look a lot like the Ori transport rings. Remember these rings, they're really kind of smooth and rounded and they're engraved with the same kind of runes that appear on the Prior's face, the scarification. It makes sense because the transport rings are effectively a smaller version of Stargates. We get that from SG-1, that they work on basically the same principle as the Stargate, only over shorter distances. The closest we ever got to seeing an Ori Stargate on screen is this painting. 
This is a wall mural that is in Adria's chamber in the movie Stargate The Ark of Truth. It shows an outdoor scene in a forest with an Ori army, and there's a Stargate here, but you can't really tell very well what it looks like. I think that the artist on the show probably just modeled this Stargate after Milky Way Gate with its familiar red chevrons. Pandas asks, what happened to Atlantis? Is it still in San Francisco Harbor? What happened to the SGU crew? Is SG-1 still active? These are all great questions, of course, that we'd love answers to when Stargate returns. We want Amazon and MGM to greenlight a new in-canon series that's set in the universe that Brad Wright and Jonathan Glasner and Robert Cooper created. That's where we might get some answers to these questions, questions that, where the shows left off when they went off the air. For my money, I'm gonna guess no, Atlantis is not still in San Francisco Harbor. The idea from Joe Malazzi and Paul Moley when they wrote a script for Stargate Extinction, which was going to be the Atlantis follow-up movie, was that Atlantis had gone to the surface of the moon. There's a reference at the end of Stargate Continuum to Earth's new moon base. That was going to be Atlantis, but it wasn't going to be there permanently. It was going to be there at the beginning of the story until it went back to the Pegasus Galaxy. I think that's more likely that they got Atlantis off the surface of the planet pretty quickly so that it wouldn't be discovered, right? The wrong power failure at the wrong time and suddenly the city's visible to the whole world. So put it on the dark side of the moon and deal with the fact that any incoming wormhole now goes to Atlantis because we learned that Pegasus gates take priority over Milky Way gates. So any team dialing in is gonna end up in Atlantis instead of in Stargate Command. That's not a permanent solution, but it makes sense that Atlantis would end up being sort of a temporary base of operations for Earth's Stargate program. Venom Pure Evil says, it would be cool if instead of trying a reboot, we could instead have most of the cast members from the main and spin-offs working together. Not technically a question, but I do want to address this. We've been covering on GateWorld over the last year or so, Brad writes multiple comments about what it is he's working on, what pitch he has. He's got a script written, and since he launched his podcast with The Companion this last spring, he's actually talked to a lot of the Stargate cast directly and told them that he's written their characters into the script. Michael Shanks, Daniel Jackson is in Brad's script. Amanda Tapping, Samantha Carter is in Brad's script. Ben Browder's Cameron Mitchell is in Brad's script. I'm sure there are others as well. The idea is not that this would just be a revival of SG-1, but that these characters would be brought in to launch something new, with new characters, with a new setting, with a new team. And that is exactly the kind of show that I'm looking for, something that's set in the same continuity, that can bring in familiar faces, maybe not as a main cast member, but certainly as guest stars, but then introduces us to new characters and can have new adventures through the Stargates. This is what I want Amazon and MGM to greenlight. I want them to greenlight Brad Wright's story. And it would do just what you say. It would bring in cast members from the old shows along with something new, rather than wiping everything off the table and rebooting the universe. Jith and Jacob asks, we never found out where the legends of the ninth Chevron came from. We just start SGU with them stating they exist. I'd like to know more about the legends and where they got the address to Destiny from. This is a terrific question. This is where SGU starts. If you remember the pilot, they talk about the fact that species all over the galaxy have developed myths and legends about the ninth Chevron, why it's on the Stargate and where it might go. And I think it's just from the fact that, well, there's Stargates all over the place. Thousands of worlds have Stargates and the Stargate has nine Chevrons on it. Those like Earth, who have maybe access to eight Chevron addresses, uh, recognize that those go to another galaxy. The ninth Chevron was this big mystery. So all these different planets all across the galaxy started to create myth and lore about what the ninth Chevron might be for. Ultimately, the address to destiny is the only nine Chevron address that we've ever found. The only one that we think at this point probably exists at all. And that was discovered in the ancient database in Atlantis. Tom P, I'm still a bit confused about what would happen if someone entered the Dakara Stargate when it was connected to every other gate in the galaxy. This one always got me as well. Ball had this computer program that allowed a single Stargate to dial out and connect to every other gate in the galaxy simultaneously. 
It works really well as a plot point when you're trying to eliminate all of the replicators across the Milky Way with the Dakara super weapon. But what if you send matter through that stargate? If you connect one gate to a thousand or 5,000, we don't know how many gates there are, and you, you throw a pebble through or a person steps through, does that person get duplicated by the Stargate's mechanisms? And now there's a thousand different Sam Carters out there, a thousand different Jack O'Neills out there, or does it tear a person apart and they're gonna fail to reintegrate? It's a great question that the show just doesn't give us enough to answer. I would like to think that the Stargate has enough safeguards built into it that it's not going to replicate people or things. Energy waveforms, yes, it can produce that over and over and over again through different stargates, but matter, I'm gonna say that's probably gonna be destroyed. Keith Ellison asks, how long in between zap blasts before it will no longer kill you? So if you watch Stargate SG-1, you know one shot stuns, two shots kill, and three shots disintegrates. But of course we've seen people zatted multiple times over the course of the series. It's clear that if you get zatted once, that energy dissipates fairly quickly. If you get zatted again an hour later or a day later or a year later, it's not like you're gonna die on the spot because your cells have been prepared for that second zap blast. The first shot is not permanent, so if you get zatted twice in a row, that's lethal. But if you get zatted once and the second shot doesn't come until a little bit later, well, I think the energy probably dissipates out of your cells within a matter of seconds. Zet and Pelly Gaming asks, could Jack O'Neill use Goa'uld technology after blending partially with Kanan? Samantha Carter, after all, could use Goa'uld technology like the, the hand device and the healing device after she was host to Jolinar of Malkshire. The answer is no, and it's because, primarily, Kanan died outside of Jack's body. Remember, at the end of In the Line of Duty in Season 2, when Jolinar died, the symbiote saved Carter's life. And then the symbiote itself, which has Naquita in its system, broke down within her body. That's why she has Naquita, that's why she has like a ghoul detector. She can sense the presence of other symbiotes, she can use ghoul technology because she has Naquita in her system from when the symbiote broke down in her body. Kanan left Jack's body before the symbiote died. Grigori1 asks, what kind of special shoes do the Tolans have to stop them falling through the floor? This of course is because the Tolans have phase technology. They can walk through walls, they can walk through stargate irises. Why don't they just fall through the floor? I don't know. Jim Sangreal asks, as a newbie, having only watched the movie and SG-1, I'd like to know a little more about everything. However, the big ones for me are, when will the other series make it to Netflix? What are the best books or non-canon stories in other media from the Stargate universe? And what happened to Daniel and Vala post SG-1? Jim, there's a lot here. You might be aware that Amazon recently purchased MGM. So in fact, I think it's pretty unlikely that Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe are going to appear on Netflix anytime soon. SG-1 has been on Netflix because MGM licensed the rights to it, but now that Amazon is purchasing MGM, we've got an increasingly shrinking window where there might be new licensing deals in effect. That's because the deal hasn't closed yet. Amazon's acquisition of MGM probably won't be done until early 2022. In the meantime, they might show up briefly for a few weeks or for a few months, but long term, we expect that all of the Stargate shows are going to be on Amazon Prime and probably not licensed anywhere else. As far as the best books or other non-canon stories that are set in the Stargate universe, Fandemonium has been publishing officially licensed Stargate novels for going on a couple of decades now. There's a lot of great stories there. I'm going to leave it for people who have read some of those books to post in the comments below. Give us your favorite Stargate novels. Which ones of the SG-1 novels, the Atlantis novels, do you think are the best of the best that someone who is new to the franchise ought to pick up and read? I haven't read them myself, but I've heard really good things about A Matter of Honor and The Cost of Honor by Sally Malcolm. These novels follow up on the second season episode, A Matter of Time, and it tells the story of that team that was left behind on a planet on the edge of a black hole. The Stargate Atlantis Legacy series is also very popular. There's several books and short stories that are set after season five of Atlantis and tells the story of the city going back to the Pegasus galaxy. 
We have a clip of a conversation from Dial the Gate with Sally Malcolm in this card right here, where you can see her talking about the story of the Atlantis Legacy series. SG24 asks, I read that for the episode Paradise Lost, a furling skeleton was made and was going to be used, but was later pulled and they used a human one instead. Is this real or is it just a rumor? I have not heard this one. We did a whole video on the furlings and everything that we know about the furlings, which included Paradise Lost. You can find that video linked in the card above. It's the sort of thing that might have been written into a script, but then taken out later. If it reached the point where production actually created a skeleton prop, it would have been used. But no, I think it's much more likely that that was just written to be a human utopian colonist who had died there. Uroj Fatima asks, how does the receiving gate know that it is being dialed from the start? Chevron's lighting up. If you press one of the symbols, it shows up on the other side, but many planets would have the same first symbol. Does this mean that all the planets with those starting symbols will see their chevrons light up? Really good question, and it really shows that you're paying attention. Paying attention a little bit more than I think the production itself was, at least in the early years. We see this in the early seasons of Stargate SG-1 in particular, where someone will start to dial one Stargate and the chevrons on the receiving Stargate start to light up. But in fact, the receiving Stargate shouldn't know that it's being dialed until all seven chevrons have been encoded. The answer to this question is that there is no answer. It was just a shortcut storytelling device on the part of the production. But you're right, if somebody presses one symbol on a DHD, I don't think that that symbol lights up on 500 stargates across the galaxy. Web Duelist, this is an interesting question. Could a ZPM-powered BC-304 catch up to Destiny? We've seen in Stargate Atlantis that if you take a BC-304 deep space carrier, like the Daedalus, and you stick a ZPM in it, its engines get a lot more efficient and it can travel a lot farther, a lot faster. Instead of taking a couple of weeks to cross the void between the two galaxies, Pegasus and Milky Way, it can do it in about four days or so. So I think it is entirely feasible if we wanted to crew a ship, give them a ZPM or two, if we had them to spare, and send them off to catch Destiny. It's possible, but it would take a very long time, because remember, Destiny has been traveling for so long that it's moved from one galaxy to the next, to the next, to the next. It's actually many, many galaxies away from the Milky Way right now. So yes, I think in theory, a 304 could catch them if they knew where they were, but it would probably be a multi-year mission. Linda Alexander asks, what was the power source for Ronan's blaster and why did it seem endless? I can't recall him ever having to reload it. Why didn't they replicate it, seeing as it was so effective against the Wraith? Go and watch the episode Travelers. It's in season four, episode five, and we see there where Ronan's gun came from. It's Traveler's technology. Evidently, he encountered them at some point and walked away with one of these. As to why it never seems to run out of power, like most advanced technology in the Stargate universe, its power source is probably crystal-based. So it's something that would run theoretically for many, many years, if not centuries. In theory, the team could adapt that technology, but it's not something that we ever really saw them try. If you could get your hands on one of Ronan's blasters, you'd rather use that, right? Rather than taking the crystal out and trying to adapt it or replicate it in human-made technology. Jeff Martin asks, why on earth are they supposedly going to make a new animated series? You might have seen this rumor floating around the interwebs that there is a new Stargate animated series in the works, that there's a new movie in the works or a movie trilogy, maybe Kurt Russell is gonna be in it. These don't come from a reliable source, and so I'm sorry to say they're not true, or at least this is not what MGM or Amazon is planning right now. There was a short-lived Stargate animated series 20 years ago, Stargate Infinity, I think in concept, there could be a really cool Stargate animated series. Looking at what Trek has been doing with Lower Decks and with the forthcoming Stargate Prodigy, good science fiction storytelling could be set in this universe and it could be really interesting and it could be really fun. But no, there's nothing in the works right now. Unless it's reported in major trade publications and on GateWorld.net, this is just rumors and you shouldn't believe it. Tadra Storm has another technical Stargate question for us. 
Tater asks, how did the iris survive the kawoosh when the gate opened while the iris was closed? We do see this several times in the show. The iris is closed with an incoming wormhole. The wormhole event horizon is stable, but the irises remain closed the whole time. So why doesn't it get destroyed like other matter that's in front of the kawoosh? Well, the closest that we get to an explanation in canon for this is the fact that the iris is so close to the event horizon, a few micrometers, that it doesn't allow matter to reintegrate. So the idea with the iris is not that something is coming through the stargate and hitting it, but that the energy that's being transferred through the wormhole never gets to reintegrate at all. So there's no matter hitting the iris. That's how close it is to the event horizon. So the idea with the kawoosh would be similar. The iris is so close to the event horizon that even as the wormhole forms, it's not able to kawoosh out and have anything actually impact the iris. Let's do one more. This one comes from Oliver Sacco, who asks simply, is Jonas dead? No, Jonas cannot be killed. Jonas is immortal. Eventually we find out that the Ori have conquered the planet Langara. I really like the idea that Jonas survived that, that he ended up being a leader in an underground resistance movement, and after the Ori and the Priors were defeated, he once again became a leader of the people. I would love to see more of Jonas in the future. I think Koran Nemec is a terrific addition to Stargate. Uh, whether it's exploring the character through novels or comic books, or bringing him back into live action. I'd love to see more of Jonas Quinn. He's not dead. Well, thanks everyone for submitting your questions. This is a ton of fun. I hope it turns out okay. If you wanna see another video like this, again, keep leaving your questions in the comments below. Like this video, share it with a friend, give us a subscription, and we'll see you on the other side.